Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming and joining me in this talk. Um, so my name is Joachim Holmir, uh, and I'm uh, the co-founder and indie developer at Neat Corporation. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about ShadyForge. Uh, so ShadyForge has been essentially the, the whole idea of ShadyForge was to make shader creation accessible to artists. And that's something that I felt that Unity wasn't really adapted to that at all. Um, and especially coming from an Unreal Engine background, um, it seems like that taboo word that you can't really say. But um, <coughs> it's kind of funny how some presenters like dodge the word Unreal Engine and say like other engines. But um, all right, so uh, what is ShaderForge? Um, so for the, uh, how many of you know what ShaderForge is, by the way? Oh, wow, that's a lot of people. Nice. <laughs> cool. So uh, how many of you uh, have used a node-based shader editor before? All right, cool. Uh, so how many of you have used the Unreal Engine shader editor? All right, cool. So, um, so for those of you who don't know, um, ShaderForge is a node-based shader editor for Unity that allows artists to create shaders in a much more intuitive way uh, without coding whatsoever. Uh, so it has a visual intuitive interface where you can connect nodes and have visual feedback for pretty much everything you do. So in this case, this is a time lapse of uh, a shader being created. Um, and it has been used for quite many different projects. Uh, so this is from a guy named uh, Philip Kolianos. Uh, this is a science fiction game he's working on. And here are some, some of his environments. And he's using a lot of different shader combinations of various types. Um, and he's also using the SkyShop plugin for ShaderForge to make these scenes. Um, and uh, here's another shader uh, created by uh, Quantum Theory Entertainment. He's probably in this room somewhere. Yeah, over there. Cool. Um, so this is a cloud shader where you can modify the color of the clouds, the contrast, and the density of them, uh, as well as even change the shape of the clouds. So this is all done with a custom shader. Uh, here's, here's another example. Uh, so this is uh, created by Might and Light. Uh, this is a time lapse of their uh, season system in their game Shelter 2. Um, so that's one of their upcoming games. So as you can see, it transitions from summer and then into autumn. Um, and then from autumn, it then changes to winter. And pretty much all, of, all you see here is done using uh, ShaderForge. Um, so, the idea of ShaderForge is, um, uh, or the basic structure of ShaderForge is that you have a central node area where you place all your nodes, uh, and you connect all the nodes there, and that hooks into the main node, and then you have, uh, on the left-hand side, you have a pre real-time preview, and then various settings for your shaders. Um, so, in this talk, I'm going to talk about why I started writing ShaderForge, as well as uh, some of its features and design, just to give you a quick rundown of what it is. And then some sales statistics. Uh, it seems quite hard to get by sales stats, so I'm just going to like throw numbers at you. Um, and then there's going to be like questions sections if you have any questions. And then I'm going to announce a new feature in ShaderForge. Um, so the reason I started writing ShaderForge is for multiple reasons. Uh, so um, I guess I'm going to start out with, with some background. Um, I started doing games with Game Maker. I think it was around version 6.1 or so. Um, had a very basic coding language, and the whole thing was quite tile-based and, and quite simple. Um, and then I went to the Source Engine, doing uh, Half-Life 2 mapping and uh, Team Fortress 2 mapping. Uh, then I went to the Unreal Engine, as you might have guessed. Um, and then I did various projects there. Then I went to Unity. Uh, So when I did uh, Team Fortress 2 mapping, that was sort of the first time I went into game development on a professional level. It was just noodling around before that. And at the time, I really wanted to become like a level designer or a level artist. That's like, that was my dream job. Um, and I really enjoyed so many different aspects of working with a level, because you have to do a level design, you have to do a level art, you have to work with lighting, placing props, and you have to modify all the geometry in the level. Uh, so there are so many different aspects to making a level. Um, and also QA and testing, of course. Um, so I sort of poked around in all of those different areas, and I really enjoyed looking at that whole spectrum. Um, 
I also did a project. Uh, this is a really fun project. Uh, so this is a combined project between uh, Teotl Studios and Valve Software. Um, so this was for their marketing campaign for Portal 2, uh, where they had, I think it was around 12 indie games uh, that had like Portal 2 assets and themes in their games. And then they ran an, like an alternate reality game where you sort of had a whole puzzle you needed to put together uh, to solve some Portal 2 thing uh, that led to the announcement of Portal 2. Uh, so this was done in the Unreal Engine. Um, and it was really cool to both get a hold of Valve's Portal 2 assets before the release of the game, um, <laughs> and also just to work in the Unreal Engine, because uh, I hadn't really done that properly before. And the Unreal Engine had, had a really nice material editor. Um, so I used that in a game called Unmechanical as well. Um, ha have any of you played Unmechanical, by the way? No, not really. Okay, cool. <laughs> So Unmechanical is just a, it's a 2.5D uh, sort of platformer game uh, made in Unreal Engine as well. Um, and um, in, uh, in Unmechanical, I did a lot of modeling. So that was sort of the first time I went into modeling, um, as well as doing a lot of shaders and materials in, uh, in the Unreal Engine. Uh, so having all of these engines behind me, I got quite a nice overview over how game development pipelines looked and uh, what tools were really useful and what tools were not useful and so forth. Um, so that was one of the reasons why I started writing uh, Shady Forge. Another tool, so um, I was at um, uh, a game design school in uh, Stockholm called Future Games. So I was there supervising students in, uh, in their game projects. So I think there was around four game projects at that time. And um, that, then again, I saw like the whole development pipeline from start to end on four projects. And I saw all the things that the students needed. So they kept asking me, like, how do I make a shader that does this? How do I make a shader that does that? And so on. Um, so I, I think I, I did the thing that most people would do at that time. So I just pointed them to the Strumpy Shader Editor. Uh, so this is sort of the standard uh, shader editor for Unity. And I felt that it was, it was a bit, it was not as intuitive as I wanted it to be. And it seems like the students agreed. So uh, they felt that it was not very visual and not very intuitive. Uh, that's sort of understandable as well, because uh, Tim Cooper, uh, the guy who made it, was, uh, he wasn't really finished. He wasn't really finished with it. Um, and so he was hired by Unity before he could finish it. So, and then it went open source, but nobody really picked it up. And uh, so, yeah, it wasn't. It sort of went abandoned and didn't work properly. Um, and, and the students were used to working in the Unreal Engine. They had used the Unreal Engine before, and they had all of these visual nodes that it really wanted to have uh, in Strumpy. Um, at the same time, I was also working on a game called Flowstorm. Um, so I started thinking about shaders more properly at, uh, at that time, given all the requests from the students. And I hadn't really done shader coding before, so I, I thought I'd just jump into it and try and see what I could do. Uh, so in this game, you fly around with this rocket. And uh, I wanted the rocket to have like really strong and sharp highlights as you fly past these light sources. Um, so to give this uh, really an arcade look and like lights flashing by as you pass by them. Uh, so I looked into the uh, Unity default materials. Um, and I tried to make it as shiny as possible, which was quite hard. Um, so I just took the specular material and cranked up the specular color to the maximum value, did the same with the shininess, and then it's not really shiny. Uh, so I wanted it to be more shiny. Uh, so I just did a really simple shader tweak. Uh, I just added numbers, essentially, instead of sliders. So I replaced the shininess number, uh, or the shininess slider, with a shininess number. And then I added a specular strength multiplier. Uh, so it was a really, really simple tweak. Uh, so essentially it looks like this. So the left-hand side is the Unity shader, and the right-hand side is the modified shader. So if I just tone away the diffuse component. Um, now, if I in increase the glossiness of these objects, you can see that the, the Unity shader still looks quite matte compared to the right one. Uh, and then I also added that booster so I could increase the specular strength. And you can see on the right-hand side now that it's actually blooming because it's so strong. And this is exactly the effect I wanted to have. So 
Flowstorm was showcased at the Nordic Game Conference, and people came up to me and talked, uh, asked a lot of questions about Flowstorm. And one of the most common questions was like, uh, what game is this, uh, or what engine is this made in? And uh, I, of course, replied that it's made in Unity. Um, but most people seem to be quite surprised. Like, it didn't look like it was made in Unity. And I think it was thanks to those small shader tweaks. So I started digging into the shaders a bit more and tried to see, like, what else could I do using shaders. And so I spent about a week doing nothing but shader coding. Um, and I just realized that uh, when I did that, I realized that shader coding was quite stupid. And it felt, felt a bit weird just doing it. So. Um, so I'm using the word magic in my talk. So that's the power of apparently influencing events by using mysterious or supernatural forces. And this is a common way of looking at shader coders. Like they're doing their dark magic and weird things and like drawing salt shaker pentagrams on the floor. And that's sort of a, that's sort of a common way of looking at uh, shader coders. And it doesn't really have to be that way. So I'm going to try to dispel that. Um, so a little warning, uh, there is some math and shader code ahead, so if you're an artist who really dislikes that, please don't leave the room. Um, it's, it's there to illustrate a larger point, so. All right, um, this is a, quite a simple equation. Um, this is a Fresnel equation, and, and a Fresnel equation is essentially like a rim light shader. Um, so it looks essentially like this. So you can see that it's white toward the edges and then black towards the center. So that's the, the very basic Fresnel implementation. Um, so what this is, is one minus the dot products between the normal vector and the viewing vector raised to the power of a sharpness value. So we're gonna do this in a shader. Uh, so here's a very basic shader. Um, there's basically just a skeleton of a shader. Uh, all it says is, render this object as a prop in world space and make it red. Uh, so it's just red, nothing else. So there's no uh, self-shadowing, there's nothing like that, it's just red. Um, so that looks like this. So we're gonna change this shader so that it has the Fresnel effect. So I'm gonna go through this quite quickly. Um, so you don't have to follow along with all of it. So, um, so first we just insert the Fresnel equation like this. So this is like a direct translation from the mathematics to the shader code. So it says uh, pow one minus dot nv uh, comma sharpness and that's it. And then we return the Fresnel value. So we just want to have the Fresnel value uh, output uh, per pixel. Um, but this won't work at all. Uh, so this won't compile whatsoever. Um, so we need to do a lot of more tweaks. So first we need to define n and v uh, and sharpness. So we can start by defining sharpness. So we add the sharpness value up there, and we also need to add like default values for this sharpness value, uh, and that's above this code, um, but I'm not including it here for simplicity. Um, all right, and then we need to define n and v. So n and v is the normal vector and the viewing vector, so let's do that. So now we're defining the viewing vector. So in that case, we need the world space camera position, and we need to subtract the world position, and then we normalize that vector, and that gives us the vector pointing from the surface toward the camera. And then we do the same for the normal vector. Uh, we simply take the normal direction from the vertex shader and normalize that. Okay, so this won't work. Um, we need to actually pass normal data into this shader. So let's do that. Um, and then we also need to pass data from the vertex shader to the fragment shader. So we can't just use things in the fragment shader and expect it to work. Um, so we need to do this. So right now we're just assigning the normal direction from the uh, vertex data. And then we do the same for the world position. Um, now this won't work either because these coordinates, uh, v.normal and v.vertex, they're in local space. So we need them in world space. Uh, so we need to uh, transform them using a matrix multiplication like this and then mask out the x, y, and z components from that uh, for both of them. Uh, and for the normal direction, we also need to typecast it to a float for a value in order to do this uh, matrix multiplication. Uh, all right, um, we're still not done. So now we need to pass this like through a tunnel uh, from the vertex shader to the fragment shader. So we need to do that for both the normal direction and the world position, like so. Um, and there's one more thing we need to do. 
So at the bottom, it just says return for null. We need to typecast that to a four component value instead of just a one component value. So we need to output RGBA. So we can do that that way. Um, all right, and that's actually it. Um, so this is a fully functional uh, rim light shader. Um, so this is essentially what we wanted to do. And this is what we had to do just to get this to work. And I hope I'm not the only one who sees the problem with that. Um, so that's sort of one of the major reasons why I felt that even though I now know how to shade code shaders, it's just a stupid way of doing it. Uh, because you're spending so much time just doing all of these dependencies while you want to focus on the defining part of the shader. So I wanted to make a system where you could, uh, oh yeah, right, so all the red stuff, that's the crap I have to do to get this to work while the green part is the shader, uh, essentially. So I wanted to make sure that people could focus on the green part uh, rather than just focusing on all the dependencies uh, along with it. Um, so in ShaderForge, essentially the same shader looks like this. So you have a sharpness value, and you plug that into the Fresnel, uh, Fresnel node, and then you plug that into emission, and it works. Um, now, this is a bit of a sheet, because Fresnel is sort of a specific node. Um, but we can also do it manually. Uh, that is to say, directly translate the mathematics and then go with that uh, in ShaderForge. So just going to show you how that would look. All right. Um, so uh, first we need the normal direction, and then we need the viewing direction. And then we need to do the dot product of those two. So immediately we get a visual feedback for what that actually does. So instead of just having anonymous uh, nodes or anonymous symbols in a mathematical equation, we have a visual feedback like this that actually tells you what this operation does. Uh, so now just by looking at this, we can see that it's dark around the edges, or I don't know if you can see that, but uh, it's dark around the edges and then white toward the center. So in this case, we might just figure out the rest of this. Um, so we do a one minus node. And, and we can see that it's inverted. So now it's white along the edges and then black toward the center. And then if we want to control the sharpness of that, uh, we could do that using a power node. And then put a value node there that we can tweak per material if we want to. So that's our sharpness value. So we can set that to 2, for instance. And that's about it. Yeah, and then we can also insert the material pawn. Yeah, so then it works. Um, and you can also, of course, change these values in real time. So you can see that these nodes uh, adapt to all of your values here. Uh, so if I type 5, it will update and looks more sharp. And if I type 1, it's uh, very uh, diffuse like this. Um, so the whole idea of visual feedback is sort of central to ShaderForge. Um, because it gives you a lot of advantages, especially when working in a team. So for instance, if, um, if this was a large shader and you had a lot of these, uh, in order to understand what the shader would do, you don't have to look at all of these nodes. So it's enough just by looking at this node to see that, OK, this is some sort of rim light. Um, so looking at these, you can see that, OK, it's some sort of rim light you can tweak. And then whoever else might want to add something to this shader can just add it after this uh, without having to parse the entire node tree. Um, so for instance, if I wanted to uh, multiply this by some sort of color, I just add a multiply node, add a color node, hook those up, and now I can change the color of this rim light. And you still get the visual feedback from doing that. All right. So Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about some of the features of ShaderForge, just run through uh, quite many of them. Uh, and primarily, that's going to be about the main node. Uh, the main node is sort of the heart of your shader. That's where everything is connected. Um, and essentially, each of these inputs uh, define a specific part of the shading process. So you have the basic category, the lighting category, the transparency category, and the geometry category. Um, so, uh, diffuse. Um, so now I'm going to fade a lot of values from 0 to 1. Um, so in, 
Uh, now I'm just fading in the diffuse. So now I'm fading it out, and now I'm fading it in. So this is where you usually input your diffuse textures and whatnot. So in this case, it's just a color. Um, and I've set up uh, two light sources here. Uh, there's one directional light pointing this way, and a point light sitting next to the uh, material pond like this. So this is a diffuse shader. So that's light hitting your object and then scattering uniformly in all directions. Uh, then there's diffuse power. Uh, diffuse power is uh, not a realistic effect at all. Uh, it's just a, sort of a hack, uh, but it can be used to approximate certain effects, such as uh, car paint shaders uh, and other like multi-layered uh, effects. So increasing diffuse power will sort of look like uh, when you increase shininess or glossiness. Uh, but this is still not a, a specular reflection. This is just a diffuse component. Uh, then there's specular. So that's the regular old specular highlights. Uh, and you can, of course, fade that out, fade that in, and mask it by a specular texture and do pretty much whatever you want with it. Um, yeah. Uh, then there's glossiness. So the gloss input is, of course, the uh, glossiness of the object. So that's what physically based shaders call roughness or the smoothness of the surface. So increasing glossiness will make the highlight smaller and sharper, while decreasing it will make it more diffuse. Uh, then there's a normal input. So normal is a custom normal direction for uh, every pixel of your shader. So now I'm going to fade in a normal map. So that's, it's usually used for normal maps, uh, but you can also use normal maps in like more creative ways. So for instance, you could fade between different normal maps or animate normals, uh, or have detail normals fade based on distance to the surface and so forth. Um, you can also use a normal input to compensate for, if you're doing like GPU geometry transformation, uh, you might need to reconstruct the normal vector in order to uh, handle the changes in the normals uh, of the surface. Um, okay, then there's emission. That's probably the most simple one. It just outputs its inputs. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so right now I'm just fading it from black to white, and it's just, well, fading from black to white. Um, so that's usually used for glowing effects. So if you have a texture with light sources in it, you might want to have the light sources be masked out and be uh, input into the emission channel. Then there's transmission. Uh, I've colored this green uh, sort of only because it's usually used for foliage. Um, so transmission is light passing through the object and coming out directly on the other side. So if I increase transmission now, you can see that uh, the directional light is uh, fading in on the other side of the objects. And uh, the same goes for the point light as well. Um, so you can see that this sort of has this issue of having these uh, black lines along the object. Uh, that's because the normal direction of the surface is completely perpendicular uh, to the direction of the light. Um, so transmission is usually used in combination with light wrapping. Uh, light wrapping is a subsurface scattering approximation. It's very, very, very not accurate at all, uh, but it's, uh, it's very cheap. Uh, so it's usually work, it works best for smooth objects. So if I increase light wrapping, you can see that it sort of wraps around the object. Um, and it sort of gives this translucent effect of the shader. Uh, so this is usually used, again, in combination with transmission, um, usually for vegetation or like candle wax and uh, skin as well. Um, then there's diffuse ambient lights. Uh, diffuse ambient light is really very simple. It's just uh, whatever you input multiplied by your diffuse. Um, but it's usually used for IBL. Um, so in this case, I've set up a scene here with uh, a sky shop skybox in the background. Um, and I'm going to just disable the real time lights and then fade in uh, the sky shop IBL. So, in diffuse ambient light, it's quite common to use a SkyShop plugin for ShaderForge, uh, and then just plug in the SkyShop assets. Uh, so the SkyShop assets uh, have these pre-convoluted uh, cube maps that you can use. So you can see that the, the orange wall here has an orange reflection on the object. Uh, and then this bright blue sky has a bright blue reflection uh, on top. But this is just a diffuse ambient light. Uh, so if I were to have a texture on this, this would be multiplied by that texture. But in this case, it's just uh, a white uh, object. So I can fade this in and out. And I can, of course, use it in combination with the direct light as well. All right. Uh, then there's specular ambient light. That's pretty much the same, uh, but it's the specular reflections instead. Um, 
so in this case, you can see that it's quite a metallic matte object. Um, but specular ambient lights uh, with SkyShop's assets are us usually used in combination with uh, glossiness. So if I increase glossiness, you can see that the cube map is affected by the glossiness values as well. So now it's like a perfect mirror reflection of the environment. And this, again, is uh, multiplied by your specular uh, input. Uh, right, and that's, of course, can be used in combination with uh, real-time lights as well. Uh, right, uh, then there's custom lighting. Um, that's essentially where you can set up your custom lighting methods. So that's per light source nodes, essentially. So in this case, I've set up a shader that has a Unity logo for every light source. Um, and that can, of course, be any texture, so it's just a mask for every light source. Um, and you can use that for uh, whatever custom lighting you want to do. Like if you want like anisotropic reflections and whatnot, you can do that in custom lighting. Uh, then there's alpha, uh, which, is, which is usually used for alpha blending. So I can just fade the alpha out like this and then fade it in. Um, and alpha, as probably most of you know, has, <coughs> has a lot of sorting issues. Like if you have multiple uh, alpha blended objects, they will have sorting issues and one will pop in front of the other and so on. Uh, so it's, you, you usually use uh, alpha clipping when you want many of them. Uh, so alpha clipping is a, um, a method of uh, instead of having partially trans partial transparency, uh, you will either have uh, fully opaque or fully transparent pixels. So in this case, I'm going to dissolve this using a texture, uh, like so. And the, the advantage of alpha clipping is that you don't have the same sorting issues as you have with alpha, uh, alpha blending. Uh, and you also get a lot of other benefits. So you can have the shadows follow along to whatever your custom alpha clipping is doing, uh, which you don't get with uh, uh, alpha blending. All right, uh, then there's refraction. Uh, I've set up a shader here with quite many effects already as it is, uh, but it has, um, uh, has the sky shop reflections and uh, has sort of a Fresnel effect to make it look like, look like glass. Um, so I'm going to fade in uh, the refraction effect. So refraction is essentially a screen space distortion of the background. So that can be used for making glass like this um, or for making uh, things like water. Uh, then there's outline width and color. Uh, this is not perfect. Uh, it's, it's a very cheap effect, um, but it looks like this. Uh, so it essentially just uh, renders your mesh uh, duplicated uh, with flipped normals and extruded. Uh, but it's extruded along the normals, so hard I just usually get these holes. I don't know if you can see it uh, at the flat area, but yeah. So outline's just a sort of a hacked in feature. Um, and you can set the color of this one as well, so now I'm fading it from black to white. Uh, but pretty much any of these inputs can be modulated by texture or modulated over time or anything you want. So, um, so but right now it's just between black and white. Uh, then there's vertex offset. So vertex offset can be used for animating shaders. So in this case, I'm doing um, this. Um, so <laughs> it's just a sine wave being pushed through the UV coordinates. Um, and uh, you usually use this for like wind animation in your foliage or grass, um, uh, or having like uh, things change shape based on its position in world space um, and and things like that. Um, there's no tessellation or displacement I can show you because I'm on a Mac right now, um, and Unity hasn't uh, updated OpenGL for it, so yeah. Uh, but there is tessellation and displacement in Shaderforge, so you can use that if you're on a Windows platform. Um, all right. So one of the more core parts of Shaderforge is that I wanted to make sure that it feels like it's made for artists and not made for shader coders. Um, so there's been quite a lot of small design things. Um, but I think a lot of small things add up to make a nice whole. So uh, I'm just going to talk of some of those things. So for instance, uh, the main node of Shaderforge, um, I can actually show that in, in Shaderforge itself. Um, so the main node has a lot of inputs, uh, but not all of them are enabled. Uh, but that's because not all of the uh, inputs are valid. Um, so I've been trying to make sure that the features you cannot use right now will be disabled. So you're not trying to use something and it won't work and so on. Um, 
So, uh, so yeah, I'm graying out some features based on what you're doing in your shader. Um, so I think it's, it really helps to like highlight the important stuff and try to hide the stuff that you're not going to be able to use. So for instance, diffuse power is, not, is now grayed out, and that's because I'm not using the diffuse input. Uh, but as soon as I plug something in there, the diffuse power will light up. Um, I also wanted to make sure that uh, placing nodes was intuitive. Um, so I borrowed pretty much every hotkey from uh, the Unreal Engine material editor. Um, but I also wanted to expand that to be a bit more flexible. So for instance, if I hold the S key, I will get a list of all the different nodes uh, that starts with S, and then I can just scroll to go through all of the nodes, and then just click to create uh, that node. So in this case, this is the uh, SkyShop Diffuse IBL. Um, and another thing that's quite of a small thing, but I think it's kind of neat. Um, so I wanted to make sure that the connections have communicate implicitly with the person creating the shader. Uh, so as you can see here, there's a value node being multiplied by a texture, and then that's, uh, that has UV coordinates. And the value node has just a single value, so the connector is just a single line. Uh, the UV coordinate node, on the other hand, has two lines, and that's because the UV coordinate has two coordinates. Um, and then, of course, the texture has an RGB output, so that's three lines. Uh, another thing I wanted to do was to make sure that um, all the data of the nodes is on the nodes themselves. Um, it might seem obvious in hindsight, but there are so many third-party tools or tools in general that have the system where you select an object and then you see values in the inspector. Uh, Unity, for instance, is doing this. And uh, it's understandable in the, case, in the case of Unity because with Unity you have so many different objects that have so many different values. Uh, and you also want to be able to multi-select and tweak all of them at the same time. Uh, but I don't, think, I don't think that makes sense for a shader editor because you rarely do that. Um, so I wanted to move all the custom properties for every node onto the nodes themselves. Um, so right now, as you can see here, there are so many different properties per node. Um, that's just, uh, it, it makes it much more easy to see what the shader is actually doing. And another side effect or advantage of this is that if you take a screenshot of your entire node tree, um, you will actually see every setting of that shader. Well, except for the stuff in the menus, but you will see all the per node data. Um, I also wanted to keep it quite flexible in terms of node layout and not just have a single template of nodes and then I stick with that. Um, so, for instance, the code node in the bottom right is a very custom node and has a very different way of working, uh, whereas the relay node to the left of that node is just a tiny node that outputs its inputs if you want to reroute connections. Um, all right, so another thing was to uh, optimize the way you work with shaders and make it a bit more, uh, a bit less cluttered. Uh, so here's quite a common case. Um, here we're multiplying three times in a row. Um, so we're multiplying uh, the UV coordinate node by, the, uh, by a color node. So then we get a colored gradient, and then we multiply that by a texture, so that gives us a colored textured gradient. Um, then we multiply that by a value of four, so that will increase the intensity of that, uh, that current state of the shader. Um, so I wanted to make this a bit shorter, so I allowed multiple inputs into the multiply node. Uh, so you can have up to five inputs right now. I don't think you need more than that. Um, so it's quite common to just multiply things together. So this is just one quick way of shortening that. Um, here's quite a common way also in third-party applications. So you would save to some sort of intermediate format, and then you would export that to whatever format you want to have, in this case, a shader. And then you keep uh, loading and saving through that intermediate format. Um, but I felt that it wasn't really nice to have it that way. So in Shader Forge, you, you don't have any intermediate files. So you save and load directly from the shader itself. Um, now, it's, it is sort of like that's this system, but the nodes file is inside the shader itself. And it helps a lot with version control and so forth. So uh, sales. I'm uh, just going to see how much time I have left. All right, cool. Um, so it seems quite hard to come by sales statistics. So here are some graphs. Um, so this is the first 87 days uh, since Shaderforge went live on the asset store. Uh, so it sold 1,085 copies. Um, and they seem to stabilize after about 29 days. 
And, uh, and one thing too, uh, it's quite sharp in the beginning. And I think that that's also because I ran a semi-closed beta before the release. Uh, so I think a lot of people from the beta went into, uh, went into this buying it in immediately. Um, all right, so then it's stabilized at around 7.8 units per day. Um, and then Unity asked me if I wanted to run a sale. And I've heard that sales are really good in pretty much everything. Um, so then sort of this happened. Um, <laughs> so that's during the 24-hour sale. Uh, so it was for 50% off. So that was uh, 942 units in 24 hours, uh, which is quite nuts. Um, and uh, that was about 39.5 units per hour. And that's a net $26,376. Uh, uh, so that's just during the sale. Um, so this is about how it looks right now. So this is about six days ago uh, and earlier. Um, so the sales work, <laughs> I guess is the takeaway from this. Um, so it, it's around uh, 26,000, uh, uh, no, uh, 2,655 units right now. Um, yeah, so, and the gross total is around 174,000 and a net total of 121. So I'm working full time on this. Um, all right, so this is pretty much only possible because of the asset store, so big thanks to Unity for making the asset store. Uh, it's, it's really nice. Uh, so, any questions before I announce the new feature? Uh, yes, over here. Um, you mentioned Scrum became before you did you, it became open source. Did you actually build on top of that or did you make sure you're forced to from scratch? Uh, so, you're asking if I uh, used Scrumpy's open source code uh, when I started working on Shadowforge, right? Uh, I did not do that. I wrote it from scratch. Uh, I didn't want to like jump into someone's existing code base because I'm bad at that. <laughs> so I just did it from scratch. <laughs> uh, yes? Uh, are there any tools for optimizing the shaders for different platforms within Shaderforge? Uh, tools for optimizing shaders for different platforms? Um, no, not yet. Uh, I do want to add that, but the answer to many of you guys' questions is probably, I want to do that, but I need to fix my dependency system first. <laughs> I have some really old code that I need to fix. Um, but yeah, I want to do that. Uh, yes, over there. You might have just answered this, but um, have you found any solutions for volumetric lighting or fog? Uh, volumetric lighting or fog. Uh, solutions in what way? Um, no, it's it's quite hard to do that because usually you you would do that either do, uh, using like post effects uh, or have a multi-pass shader, and multi-pass shaders is uh, not possible right now in Shaderforge. Well, except for like the outline uh, that's a multi-pass shader, um, but yeah, it's not possible right now. But it might be in the future. Uh, over there. Uh, yeah, there is a physical based shader in Shaderforge, so you can just check that box, and then it will be physically based. So, um, but I think the main advantage of Shaderforge is not, you know, particularly having a very realistic shader or a physically based shader. Uh, it's much more about the flexibility of being able to do pretty much whatever you want. Uh, but it does have a physically based shader. Yeah, over there. Mobile shaders. Um, right now, pretty much everything in Shaderforge is done per pixel, so it's not really fit for mobile development. Um, and again, I have to fix my dependency system for it to be more mobile-centric. Um, but I mean, there's, there's usually the, the usual uh, stuff, so don't make too much in your shader, don't use too many textures, um, and don't use a texture as UV coordinates for another texture, because that's really expensive. Uh, but other than that, uh, it's not really well optimized right now for mobile. But it works, usually, so. Yeah, it has a work for us. We use it as a prototype, and then we give it to our engineers to make it efficient. Yeah, that's, that's quite common, actually. Yeah, Rovio does that as well. So uh, they just make a shader in uh, Shaderforge, and then they send that to some coder who just optimizes it. So that works. 
Um, uh, yes, over there. Uh, optimization, like like per node optimizations for like uh, fixed or half or yeah, um, not yet. Uh, I want to add that, but again, that depends on the dependency system that's not finished. So I'm going to like start working on that right after Unite. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, it's, it's something I want to add uh, because right now the the shader writing is very blind. Um, it sort of writes the shader linearly. Uh, so it doesn't know beforehand what's going to happen. So, for instance, in that case, I want to know uh, which nodes will actually define a variable. So I need to know that before I write the shader. Um, so I would have to do a system to, that does that. But then, yeah, I really want to add those optimizations as well. Um, yes, over there. When's your next sale? The next sale? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, as soon as possible, I hope. I mean, sales are nice. I would want to have it all the time. Um, but uh, it's up to Unity. So it's, uh, I don't know when the sales are going to hit. So yeah. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned that you use the actual shader file as the, sh the file there's no intermediate. Is uh -huh. there any issues storing metadata about anything with that? Is everything packed into the shader? Uh, everything is in shader. I can show you how it looks. Uh, so we can take a look at this shader. Uh, so Um, yeah, it should. Okay. So uh, it essentially looks like looks like this. So here's my very long line of serialized data. Uh, so yeah. So here's my uh, arbitrary symbol separation system. Um, so yeah, this is the serialized stuff. And you can hand modify this. It's just really annoying. Um, but yeah, so it's just there. All right, uh, any more questions? Okay, cool. So um, the secret new feature. Um, <laughs> so um, all right, I'm just going to jump into it. Um, so the new feature is essentially a, it's not out yet, but it's coming soon. So it's a system for real-time area lights. Um, so oh, thank you. <laughs> So this is uh, in ShaderForge. It will essentially be a checkbox. You check, I want to support area lights, and it should work. Um, uh, it, it has a few artifacts. It's not perfect, and I'm not quite done with it. Uh, but it works uh, as it is right now, uh, sort of OK. Uh, so this is running in deferred lighting, uh, the old deferred system. Uh, and the uh, disadvantage of that is, of course, that you don't get colored specular from the light sources. Um, but, but yeah. It, sort of works. So if I drag around this one, you can see that it's all uh, in real time. And you also get these reflections that you usually don't get with uh, point lights. So, um, And uh, these are, uh, you can also rotate these uh, however you want. And you can also change the shape of them. Um, and having large area lights like this uh, can be useful for doing like a fake real-time GI. So you can put some of these large objects in the wall. Uh, like if there's a big red wall, you can have real-time uh, GI from those. But I don't know how useful that's going to be given Unity's uh, new GI system. Um, um, but yeah, so that's essentially the, uh, the new feature coming soon. Um, and these also respond to the material properties you have. So if I, for instance, go to the inspector and then just tweak the uh, glossiness of this surface, you can see that it's response to, uh, well, the response to the glossiness. Um, and it's not, not perfect, like I said. So for instance, there are some artifacts you can see here, maybe, that it gets sort of blocky and weird. Um, but in most cases, it's, uh, it works. Um, all right. Uh, are there any questions on this, by the way? <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead. Huh? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, hmm. No, door. I want my floor. Wait, did I select things or hold on? Um, like so? Am 
might have been hard to see before, but yeah. Uh, so right now, the, like resizing these is really annoying. You just drag the scale handle, and it's sort of flailing around. Um, and it, it's sort of it's a problem because it's hard to pass per light source data in Unity. Um, but so right now, I'm actually it's it's a super hack. Um, but I'm sending it through the alpha channel of the color of the light source. So th so that's both the aspect ratio as well as the radius of it. Uh, encoded in a weird zigzag thing. Um, so that's hence this flating. Um, but yeah, it's, it seems to work. Um, all right, so I don't know when this is going to be finished, but I want to finish it uh, pretty soon after Unite. Um, yeah, and, and it's also quite cheap. Uh, I think it's a bit, might be slightly cheaper than like physical based shaders. Uh, so this is like a, a very, it's a BRDF essentially. So there's no like, there's no render textures, there's no post effects, it's just a BRDF. Uh, the downside right now that I have, to, have yet to fix is both uh, this flailing, um, as well as having, uh, being able to combine these lights with other light types. So right now it's, when you have a surface that's set to uh, receive area lights, it can only receive area lights. So there's no point lights uh, whatsoever. Um, I've also added support for spherical area lights, um, but I don't have it in this demo. Um, but yeah, th there is support for that as well. But the problem again is that you cannot have spherical area lights in combination with these rectangular area lights. Um, but I could do something like, if the lights, light alpha is set to zero, it will be a point light, and if it's negative, it's a spherical area light or something. But Again, it's a complete hack, and I'm sort of waiting for Unity to enable us to send custom data. Um, yeah, question? Uh, can you play huh? Um, well, Unity has built in area lights in their light mapping system. Uh, so yes, indirectly, yeah. Uh, but not these in particular. But maybe I can like combine those two, so every area light has a baked uh, one of the static versions in them. That would be nice, actually. I'm probably going to do that when it's released then. Thanks, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, question? Uh, you use shader four to change point spotlight and spotlight what? Yeah, you can, but you cannot really go beyond the maximum range that the light sources currently have. So you can change the fall off, but you cannot make it like have a longer range. Uh, because they're doing the light calling and all of that based on that maximum distance. Um, yeah, I'm just going to check the time. All right. Um, so, any more questions? Yeah. It works in forward too, but it has all of the limitations of forward with it. So, uh, I can switch to forward, uh, but. That will, of course, give me colored specular highlights, but I can still only use four light sources per object. Um, so it has still still has those limi limitations. No, it doesn't do that, and I'm not sure why. The math I wrote for this should sort of make that a point light, but it doesn't. Um, but it's still. Huh? Yeah, it's not ready. Uh, but I wanted to show it because it was a fun experiment that somehow turned into a nice feature. So, um, all right. Uh, yeah. What kind of performance would you expect for a setup like this on mobile? Oh, on mobile? No idea. Uh, I don't do mobile much, uh, but. Uh, it's not that expensive. I think actually you can have a few of these light sources, but I mean it's it is costly to run deferred on mobile. I think, um, but I mean, it's a BRDF like uh, like Blin Fong and those uh, those other shading types. So it's like a sort of a bit more expensive expensive version of that. Um, yeah. Um, all right. So I'm gonna have one more thing. Uh, after some thanks slides. Um, so first I want to give a, I promised a very special slide for this person. 
So thank you, Aras, at Unity. <laughs> Um, for skewing the priorities at Unity in my favor. Because um, he helped me out just making sure that every light source had rotation information. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to rotate it unless you had like a light cookie. So he just did that fix. Uh, so that was very nice of him. Um, and then I want to thank uh, Jenny Nordenborg for helping me out throughout, uh, for supporting me throughout the entire project. Um, and I want to thank Unity for both, well, Unity, and uh, uh, having me here and all of that. Um, and I want to thank Epic Games. Um, it feels a bit scary to like mention Epic Games here, but I want to thank them for the Unreal Engine, because it's a real nice engine, and uh, they had this uh, awesome material editor that sort of was the original inspiration for Shadowforge. I want to thank Marmoset for their uh, awesome SkyShell plugin and the assets I've used uh, in this demo. Um, as well as, uh, I want to thank uh, Quixel for their really cool mega scans textures. I've used some of them in this demo, uh, but it's, it's actually really nice. They've, like, they have this machine that scans surfaces and not, not just like, takes a picture, it scans like, the normal direction of the surface, it scans glossiness, specular, ambient occlusion, and all of that. It's quite nuts. Uh, so they have a database of all of those uh, textures. Uh, and then, of course, I want to thank you for coming here. Um, so, uh, one last thing, um, if you want a free copy of Shadowforge, you can like do something with this and then you get that. Um, all right, thank you very much. <laughs>